Hey folks, JR, back for another episode of Echoes of Shannon Street Case File. It's going to be episode 75, Tell Tommy. Before we get started, folks, as always, get a chance at that subscribe button if you hadn't already. I would greatly appreciate it. Get down in the description and be sure and click on the link. Come visit my Facebook page or my website. Get you a copy of the book, copy of the documentary. Follow my podcast. What else we got? Oh, yeah, if you like a little history lesson, you can click on that link down there for Snowy and Boom. All right, folks, we're going to jump back into the um, follow-up investigation been a few episodes since we dealt with that we'll probably do an episode or two on the follow-up investigation then we're gonna probably do another episode on the letters to the editor the part two on it and we've still got to do director holt's big press conference he had one that they had a question and answer session after he gave his statement so we're gonna we'll do his statement and which is pretty long and then we'll do the question and answer or at least as much as i can do with what i have all right folks let's uh let's get into this episode and find out what the investigators are doing city of memphis inner office memorandum to Sergeant D.R. Hawley, Security Squad, from Captain T.C. Hasty, Inspectional Services Division. And I went to the Robbery Bureau in 19 and 97. No, that's not right. 1999, June of 1999, I went to Robbery Bureau. And uh, Captain Hasty was, I think he was an inspector then, if I'm not mistaken. He used to always come in and shoot the breeze. We didn't get a lot of the big wigs hang out in our office. Everybody was scared of the robbery investigators because they knew we were all crazy. All right, date January 18, 1983, subject 2239, Shannon, Memphis, Tennessee. On Friday, January 14, 1983, Inspector S.O. Jackson, Captain C. Keenan, and myself went to Dr. Jerry Francisca's office for a conference on the wounds inflicted upon the seven male blacks that were killed during the assault on 2239 Shannon. Dr. Francisco, Dr. Bell, Dr. Harlan, and Dr. Stafford were present when the discussion took place and all the doctors were in agreement with the blow description of the wounds. The A, B, etc. and numbers are for ID purposes prior to names being known. A1, Larnell Sanders, 1, 2, 23 round to head, enters right to left, Three, two, twenty-three rounds, left side chest, right to left. B2, Michael Coleman. One, two, twenty-three to right knee. One, two, twenty-three, right palm to wrist to head. One, two, twenty-three, right wrist and forearm. C3, David Jordan, one 12 gauge shotgun blast to head, one 223 left to right and left arm. D4, Cassell Harris, one 223 shot to rear of head, left to right. E5, Earl Thomas, one 223 graze front to rear, hit right arm and chest, one 223 left front abdomen. One two twenty three left forearm into chest. One two twenty three face. F six Lindbergh Sanders. 
138 to left wrist, 1223 graze right temple, 1223 top head, front to rear up and down, G7 Andrew Houston, 3 223 to face, 138 in back, possible 38 in hand. All right, folks, what we got here, handwritten notes. You don't see handwritten notes much. What we went over in this case file, most of it obviously is supplements that came from handwritten notes. But I wanted to include these just so you could see that investigators are on a case or they're jotting down their thoughts, jotting down what people are telling them, where they're going, the whole nine yards. Uh, this one here is, says it's top Captain Holcomb. Now, I do not know what that next word is. All right. What we got here is possible people inside. Obviously, they're talking about inside 2239 Shannon. Peter Murphy, 7th Street. T.C., Bojack, which is Jackie Young, Cassell Harris, Breedlove, that's the street that they're associating him with, Ben and Tim, brothers. Now, Ben and Tim, they're brothers to Michael Coleman. And you've got number six is Snoopy. That next one, I I still can't read that one. It may say Neil, but I'm not for sure. And then we've got one, One Drives Old Dart. Now for you, anybody that's around my age, I'm 58, so you might remember the Dodge Dart. That's what they're talking about. And you've got Earl. And you've got Tyrone. And then you have Joe Nathan. All right, folks, before we get started on this page here, common practice, police investigators, or you interview somebody or you're interrogating someone, well, you take notes, handwritten notes. You then reduce those handwritten notes to a supplement, a typed supplement in the computer, which that's standard. And what you should do is, is after you've done that and you've got all that information off that handwritten note, then you destroy them. You don't keep them. You don't put them in the case file. You don't <laughs> carry them with you to court when you're testifying. You don't take anything up there with you. But a, a practice by defense attorneys in front of a jury, because this is the only way it's effective. Defense attorneys like to make a big show of the fact that you destroyed your handwritten notes. They'll ask you something to the effect of, Sergeant Howe, did you take uh, notes while you were conducting this investigation? Yes, sir. And what did you do with your handwritten notes? Well, sir, I reduced them to a typewritten supplement and then I destroyed the notes you destroyed the notes and then when the defense attorney says that he always turns to the jury and rolls his eyes or this mock horror on his face that you the investigator have destroyed your handwritten notes hoping that someone on the jury will get confused and think that there is something wrong with destroying the handwritten notes as you can see on this page here, these handwritten notes here, there's scribble on mine. You might see all kinds of little things I've drawn on there while I'm talking to somebody and that have nothing to do with the case. Anyways, enough of that gibberish. All right, at the top you see there's a phone number. Then you've got Alfreda McKinney. Female black 33 lives over on North Willette and it's got a phone number. And this right here reads like a uh, witness list. 
Then you've got Lindbergh Sanders, male black, 50, question mark, 57 to 58, 140, thin, slight. John Gaston, and now they're talking about John Gaston Hospital. That was what the med was referred to as. The trauma center was referred to, used to be John Gaston. It says six or seven years ago, J.G., reading Bible heavily, don't believe in drinking water, told Tommy Macklin world was going to come to an end on Monday, had about 10 people over on Monday and told them they had to stay three days and three nights. Now, more than likely, this information here is coming from Alfreda McKinney. You see there's a line drawn under the under the short little description of what she's saying. It says wife Dorothy Sanders Baptist Hospital private nurse firm. It's got a phone number. It says ten forty PM. Now usually if you see that that would usually indicate what time that they're actually talking to the person in question. Then they got another line, as you can tell, if you're able to see this clearly is if I was doing that it would be a separating the different people you spoke to and you've got Annie Thomas female black 26 lives over on Vandale got a phone number husband Earl Thomas male black 20 Friday evening then it says B.A. Sebastian Beagle I'm sorry Beagle that's a dog, Bagel, Mendenhall, and Poplar. Now, if you recall, when we were doing the autopsies, Earl Thomas, that's where he worked, the bagel shop, and that's at Mendenhall and Poplar. Then we've got a question mark, and got Pete, late 20s. Then we got a number one, David Lee Jordan, late 20s. Bojack, question mark. Fred, late 20s. Carnell Walls, it's the first time I've seen that name, 21, and Reginald McRae, late 20s. And if you see out beside those names, he's got, Don't eat pork, smoke a lot of marijuana. And at the bottom has two sons, which he beats all the time. Now, I'm assuming they're talking about Lindbergh Sanders. All right, top of the page, all men, no women. Hasn't been home in a week, no weapons. Own Larnell Sanders, male black 27, no drinking, Shelby Oaks Mental Health Center, called 7 p.m., asked her to come on, wife, home, Stated she would if he would take his medicine. All right, now what this is talking about is, is or at least I believe it is, it's Lindbergh asking his wife to come back home. Has not been this agitated since 1973. Let me back up. Has not been this agitated since. Now, that 1973, then it's got court order. 1974, three or four months. TPH and I. Now, that's probably the mental health facility he was at. So, all this has got to be talking about Lindbergh Sanders. Now, we got a line drawn. We got Tommy Macklin. We got daughter Lucinda Sanders, female, black, 30, 2239, Shannon. Then we've got something about mother, Saturday, 1 p.m., bad mood, gave his Bible to her. Fish is his favorite food. Had to leave because only men, disciples. Now, if you'll remember... We were doing the episodes 
earlier that Lucinda and I believe Miss Sanders had went by the house and left fish. I think it was both of them went. I think that's what they're referring to. And that they told them they had to leave. Lindbergh told them they had to leave because it was men only in the house. And we've got Pete Murphy, Squeaky, Larnell Sanders, Michael, Scrub, and Earl. And you got Daniel, 18th chapter. In the far right, you've got all other men were in bottom den. Agree with him, we'll bring him down. 10.30 a.m., he is listening to relating to radio. And remember, folks, everything that we're going over right now, these handwritten notes or Part of the case file that we looked at, discussed in earlier episodes. Now we've got the Lunch Bunch, God, Austin, pushes junk cart during day, Hunter, he is elder and younger people have to do as he says, Margot's. Parentheses says white are all devils. Police beat him real bad at hospital in 1973, and he considers that his first death. Outlaw motorcycle beat him, so I'm gonna assume that a biker gang beat him. Now that would be separate, obviously, from the one at the Mental institution, I'm assuming. I don't know where this one with the outlaw motorcycle gang occurred. Three years ago, claimed world would end. Three weeks ago, visited doctor. Monday night was end of three days. David, Lindbergh calls him George, 1532 Davis, and there's a phone number. Week ago, went to Linda and picked up a hot water heater. All right, folks, that's going to wrap up this episode. I did want to include some handwritten notes just so you would see how the handwritten notes, and, of course, they're jumbled. and They don't make a lot of sense because we're not the ones that wrote them. Only the writer should understand, or you, you hope the writer, the investigator that took those notes understands what it means in the big picture. We're gonna come back probably next episode. We may do some, uh, we'll probably do some more of the background investigation. And then we're gonna come back and we're gonna do uh, Director Holt, his big press conference. All right, folks, real quick, the picture at the top there in the red box. That's 1985. I was a park ranger at Meeman Shelby Forest State Park. I had been at, uh, I had just left Big Hill Pond State Park in McNary County. They had, we had so many rangers at Shelby Forest. There were three of us. And there wasn't enough houses. So since I was single, I stayed in one of the cabins. So I thought I was something. Anyways, folks, I do appreciate y'all. Thank y'all for hanging in there with me. We'll get back together in a few days and we'll hit it again. And as always, folks, we'll see you down the road.